everybody? Can you hear me okay? Sounds like it. We're going to go ahead and get started. We got 7 o'clock. We got a big crowd, a lot to cover tonight. So uh, without further ado, Debbie, would you? Thank you. And we will begin with Flex Loop. I pledge allegiance. Okay, first up, we have our consent agenda. I accept the motion to uh, approve the link. Mm. I move to approve the consent agenda. Move. Jennifer, move to approve the consent agenda. I second it. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passed. Okay. Uh, we have our student representatives next. Soccer boys team, uh, they lost to Wilsonville in the quarterfinals, it was a really great season. And the girls lost to Churchill in the first round. Uh, both teams had really good seasons this year. Uh, cross country did great at the state meet. They finished seventh as a team. Uh, and that's the best they've done in 27 years. Uh, and it was just awesome season for both of them. And then football just ended uh, sadly last week, or a few days ago on sun uh, Saturday. Uh, they ended the season 10-2, and two, and they had a hard-fought battle against Thurston in the semifinals, so the last four teams. Uh, winter sports have finally started. Uh, all, uh, all tryouts had great turnouts. Uh, swim practice, I think they're nearing to 100 members, which is awesome. Uh, and also wrestling is doing really well. Um, the first boys basketball game is on December 7th at St. Hans. The first girls basketball game is on December 4th at home versus Churchill. That'll be a good game. Uh, and then the first swim meet is at Malala on December 4th. And the first wrestling meet will be at uh, December 7th at the per uh, Perry Burleson uh, Cascade Invitation. And then a little about a bit about our clubs, the Las Aguilas, they had a very successful tamale fundraiser at the end of October. And they had all three in November for Dia de los Mortes, and they're using November to plan all their events, events for December. Interact Club has meetings every Thursday morning at 7.30. The week of November 4th to 8th was World Interact Week of Giving. The club gave $200 towards water filters in the countries that our parent club is sponsoring. They're also sponsoring two families this Thanksgiving through SACA by filling boxes full of items for their dinner. Many of our club members attend the Rotary Luncheon on November 18th and spend time learning about the different professions that make up Rotary. Interact is starting fundraising by selling Jamba Juice punch cards and Traeger barbecue raffle tickets. The Red Cross Cross Club had their first blood drive of the year on November 20th. There is a large shortage in the West due to canceled drives and due to the North the California fires. We had a successful turnout at our first blood drive, and we'll be holding three blood drives through the school year. Skills USA kicks off on November 21st. Students will have completed their initial training and safety requirements. This year, our team will compete in firefighting, CPR, first aid, AED, crime scene investigation, criminal justice, welding, automotive tech, culinary arts, commercial baking, cake decorating, photography, video production, and career path. Their state competition will take place in March 2020. And then ASB is almost done with our yearly Tree of Giving fundraiser. We are halfway to our goal of $5,000 to go shopping for 100 kids in our community. Okay, next up, we have our public comment period, the first one. I'll be our we are glad you're here and welcome you to address the board at this time with your ideas, opinions, questions, concerns, or compliments. 
Please be certain to sign in before you present. Remember that we all model the way for our students. And we ask that you share your thoughts and respect. The board's role during public comment is to listen. Rarely will you get an immediate response to information. If there is follow-up necessary, we will direct our superintendent to do that. In order to ensure equity among speakers, the board will limit remarks to three minutes per individual. If a group of three or more wishes to appoint a representative to speak on its behalf, the board will extend the time for remarks to five minutes. A second public comment will occur later in the agenda specific to discussion and action items of the meeting. With uh, a crowd this big, I'm going to point out as well that should we run into time constraints, we may also have to cut out some public comment because we do have business we have to get done. To the so just throwing that out there. I don't know how many folks planned on actually speaking, but uh, keep that in mind. My name is Ken Hector Silverton. With me tonight co-presenting is Leslie Kaufman, also Silverton. Uh, we have a, a fairly lengthy statement with a lot of exhibits. So our comments will be somewhat summarized. And at the conclusion, should you have questions, we're happy to answer them. But you will all get uh, printed copies of, of both our presentations, as well as the approximate 90 pages of exhibit that would be referenced in our comments. Okay. Leslie will provide the opening. Tonight you will be receiving a complaint that comes as a result of public records requests as well as growing public concern regarding verbal and written communication between board members, community members, and members of special interest groups. Actions by board members listed in this complaint show a clear pattern of engaging in activities that do not work to serve the best interest of our students, our district, and of the public. These actions occurred behind the scene, yet the, these board members publicly state clear support for board, district, and administrative decisions. Board members named in the records request have not fully complied with providing all requested communications. In the original request filed on July 3, 2019, board members transcribed their text messages rather than providing full text screenshots, and portions of email conversations were omitted. Upon further direction from the Marion County District Attorney's Office, additional records provided did not match initial transcripts. A subsequent records request also revealed that pertinent information has been deleted or lost in the transmission process. Evidence in the request also reveal an organized effort by a small group including board members aimed at changing the culture and practice within our district to further their own agenda. This appears to include ending site-based budgeting and decision making, closing small schools and mandating certain curricular programming which may be contrary to student, teacher, principal, or site choice. These communications also suggest a theme of undermining or removing board and committee members and administrators who stand against them. In addition, they seek to further influence future board and committee membership in support of their desire to fundamentally change district operations. Also referenced are gatherings by this small group taking place outside of and prior to board meetings, where they engage in the giving and receiving of feedback about what will be said and by whom at the official board meetings. What is reflected here is entirely contrary to the platform of transparency they claim to champion. Finally, information found in the request clearly demonstrates that certain board members have worked behind the scenes with members of the public to influence the resignation of former Superintendent Andy Belando, a steadfast supporter of the values and vision of Silver Falls School District. In addition, they continue to discount those who share these same values and vision this overall undermining of leadership and community vision is most concerning given the legacy of exceptional high performance that our district has demonstrated and modeled for other districts statewide. We, the 112 under, <coughs> undersigned patrons of the Silver Falls School District, pursuant to district policy KLAR, Hereby register the following formal complaint against Board Directors Shelley Nealon, 
Jennifer Traeger, Jonathan Edmonds, Janet Allenack, and Lauren Plotler. Public documents recently provided by the district expose conduct by these individuals which violate one or more district policies as more specifically identified below by the policy title and code reference, published in the Silver Falls Board of Government's Policy Manual, the Board Superintendent Working Agreement, the Superintendent Employment Contract, Agreement for Confidentiality Covenants in Hiring, State of Oregon Public Meeting Laws, State of Oregon Public Records Laws, and State of Oregon Executive Session Laws. Violations include, among other things, pursuing personal vendettas against district staff by conspiring among each other and with individual members of the public to influence employment, utilizing personal email and text messaging for board business to conceal communications from the public, and failing to fully cooperate and comply with repeated lawful requests for those communications. Uh, I believe the chair said if we represented a larger number that our time allotted was five minutes each. Is that correct? So we, that's five minutes each, correct? Thank you. Total? Okay. Again, this will all be in. So you're saying our five minutes is gone? Okay. Keep going. Keep going. Yeah, keep going. Our policy clearly states you need to present to the board chair for consideration, and you have not. So now I care about the policy. It doesn't say you have to present it to the board Well, we can have, there's 112 of us. I guess you can have each of those come up. If, if I may ask politely, how, how much time do you think you need to fit complete? It's probably going to take me three, four minutes. I'm going to summarize. I'm not going to list the individual. Uh, egregious action. I'll just give the number and with some additional comment, everything else will be in what you get fully in print. So I get it's probably an additional four minutes. I, I'm open to other board members' opinions. My opinion is we have them. Improper conduct and policy violations are as follows. And again, I'll only give you numericals. Member Neely, improper conduct identified 11. Policy violations, seven. Member Traeger, improper conduct identified four. Policy violations, four. Member Edmonds, improper conduct identified two. Policy violations, four. Member Allenack, conduct identified two, policy violations four. Member McLaughlin, improper conduct identified four, policy violations four. Requested action. The severity and amount of violations by Director Neely demonstrate a deliberate and continual disregard for board policy and for the well being of the Silver Falls School Board and District. Therefore, we request her immediate resignation as district as director, Zone 5, Silver Falls Board School. Based on conduct, policy violations, and for the future protection of the district, we ask for immediate censure of Director Laughlin by the Silver Falls School Board. We also request further training for each of them regarding roles and responsibilities of a board member board member superintendent relationships, and appropriate board member communication skills. Specifically for Directors Alan Eck and McLaughlin, we acknowledge that the above policy violations occurred before assuming their official positions on the board. However, given their board elect member status and their past leadership experience, they should have understood this behavior to be appropriate. Finally, based on the evidence presented in this complaint, and from statements made by board members to members of the public, 
We believe overall trust in our current board has been compromised. The recent public information request cited in this complaint contained incomplete email conversations and transcripts of text rather than actual screenshots, suggesting the redaction of pertinent information. Furthermore, information from executive session meetings has made its way into the public domain. Therefore, we ask the Silva Falls School Board to request a thorough third-party review and investigation into board member conduct. Should this investigation uncover additional occurrences of improper conduct and or policy violations, we ask for the immediate resignation of those board members involved. Thank you for your timely attention to this matter, and we request resolution of this complaint based on the timeline dictated by policy KLAR. And all of the names of those 112 are included, and I will present the written uh, information to you. Thank you for the extension. Mills and a three-year-old. 
And we are here tonight in support um, of all the K-8 rural schools, as you can tell by these little stickers we have. Um, as you know, these K-8 schools are currently educating the hearts and minds of over 1,100 district students. We have a wonderful and diverse district that spans over 240 square miles, stretching from the Valley Floor at Central Howell to the foothills of the Cascades at Silvercrest and everywhere in between. I have two quick points that I would like to speak on. First, each one of these schools has its own history, its own culture, and most importantly, its own needs. Our school's teachers, administrators, and parents work tirelessly to best meet the needs of the students. Good evening, Silverton High School families. This is Wade Lockett, principal of Silverton High School. Just a reminder that we will be wrapping up conferences in about 10 minutes. Uh, hope everybody has had a good night of conferences this evening, and please know that we will be resuming conferences at noon tomorrow. Hope everybody's had a great evening. Go Foxes! <laughs> So they work tirelessly to meet the needs of the students at each building. These needs are met in a variety of ways, the most important being via site-based budgeting. The site-based budget is crucial for the success of these unique schools. Not every school in our district has the exact same needs or wants for its students. Site-based budget allows for specific and individual needs of each school. Your support for the site-based budgeting is essential for the success of our students. Second, in a recent letter from the district, it was stated that the Long Range Facilities Planning Committee will be moving forward with the option of closing any of the rural schools 100% off the table. However, also at that Long Range Facilities Planning Committee meeting on the 20th, the facility report from BBL Architects indicated that it was not going to be cost effective to perform all the deferred maintenance on the rural schools. Since these two pieces of information seem to kind of conflict, I was wondering if each of you board members could publicly go on record as if they support keeping the rural K-8 schools open for the long term. Thank you for your time and your commitment to keeping the best interest of each student and every school at heart. So we actually do have an agenda item coming up discussing this, and I suspect, uh, I know I plan on so My name is Dandy Stevens. I signed in on one of the boards that was in the other room. Um, you'll know me as a former employee of the district. I was also the person that submitted the public records request back on July 3rd. Some, but not all of those documents are used in the complaint filed tonight. You will see other records at a later time. The correspondence discovered in your personal accounts do not represent an occasional inquiry from a member of the public but rather in-depth and purposeful interactions. There is no explainable reason for your actions other than you are attempting to hide what you're doing from the majority of the voters, and that is unethical. Forwarding board business from your Solar Falls School District account to your personal account is unethical. You have received extensive training over the course of several years. Every training has highlighted how you are to conduct yourselves as board members and none of these actions, as documented in the evidence of the complaint, is supported by the trainings you have received. During a May 2018 board meeting, Shelley Neelan states, in part, I do not feel comfortable sending emails. I'd like to do everything in public because I believe in complete transparency. That statement would be laughable after looking at the records request if those records were not so damaging. There were over 180 records from her personal email account and most of them had multiple email chains and responses embedded with them, within them. There are other actions listed in the evidence that are concerning. Community members list on her Facebook page that she manages Lori McLaughlin. This could be taken as a tongue-in-cheek comment, except when you consider this community member has been heavily engaged in the secretive workings of the board business based on the evidence in the complaint. A board member states that another board, mem another board member needs to go. I don't think that's your role. Board members are plotting how to manipulate community members. 
Community members are advising board members how to sway other board members. Comments of, please make edits to my comments, but don't share. These are not, you are not characters in the Game of Thrones or contestants in Survivor. And for you to behave in this manner cheapens the importance of serving on the board. I would pose the following scenario to the board. You contact your current employer and you give this person permission to speak about you to coworkers or to your customer base. And in these conversations, you give your employer permission to speak poorly of your job performance, to mock you and your actions, to call you names, and to plot on how to undermine you. However, here's where the analogy fails. In this, you are fully aware of what is going on and giving permission for it to occur. A courtesy not extended to those people you have targeted, especially the administrators that continue to work in this district. I submitted a second public records request today because I believe your unethical behaviors are continuing. The last time I submitted a request, I was tagged on Facebook and maligned by community members. In speaking with my attorney regarding this, targeting and trying to intimidate me for requesting a public record could be seen as an attempt to silence a whistleblower. Your actions are unethical. You are conducting board business in private accounts and purposely not providing the emails and the recommendation and, and the documents. Thank you for your time. Right on. Here we go. Better? Okay. Here's what I want to share after watching our largely new board after four months of business happening, um, three months with the brand new superintendent, and just a little bit longer with the brand new assistant superintendent. The word that, I, that comes to mind for me is courage. Here's what I see happening that I haven't seen happening before. I see courageous conversations happening. I see you guys working towards consensus and actually discussing issues. That's brand new. I'm so happy to see that. I see really courageous conversations happening <coughs> in our schools, between our superintendent and our administrators, talking on issues, for example, equity. Again, this is a topic that has been steamrolled before, and it's really exciting to see some progress taking place. I see courageous actions from this board and this community and our administrators. The fact that we had such fantastic turnout at the Long-Term Facilities Committee is amazing. And the fact that our superintendent was able to right away a lace of concerns, and the fact that he's invited such wide participation, that is new in this district. I'm thrilled to see it. What impresses me the most is that all of us are modeling the same for our kids, whether they're our own kids, whether they're the students in our schools. I see this being modeled with decorum, <coughs> with adhering to policies and updating policies when we need to, with fair treatment, and with equity. And I'm very impressed with it. Any transition is hard. Any parent of a toddler will tell you that five o'clock witching hour happens, it is hard. Transition to a new board, to a brand new administration, that was completely unexpected, and we had very little notice to hire an interim superintendent. It is tough, but from my perspective, I see you guys. I see you doing the hard work in. I'm really impressed, and I want to thank you for serving in what is very often a very thankless job. And I know the dozens of hours that you have to put in every single month. So we see you too. I want to see that and say thank you. Good evening, my name is Owen Bonflew, and I just wanted to stand up and um, say that I've read all the documents that have been presented tonight, and I just wanted to concur with Danny's remarks and with the remarks that are in the plate and attend, uh, and I'm sorry I forgot your name, uh, so well put. So uh, those documents do verify and validate the, the complaints that have been made tonight. <coughs>
regarding the uh, complaint itself, would you be willing to give us a few options regarding sort of next steps? I and mean, our policy lays it out, but I know that there may be some things as a new board chair I may not fully understand. Okay, real quickly um, for board members, when you look at KLAR, which will be the process that governs any complaint that the board receives, um, we need to start obviously with receiving the complaint, which we have not done yet. We've only heard about it. Once we receive it, um, the timeline that we're working under is about 90 days from the date that the complaint has been filed. Within that, you have some flexibility in terms of how we move forward. Um, it sounds like it could be lengthy, so one option would be to take the complaint, allow the board members to review the complaint, and then come back on December 9th and have a conversation about what next steps would be in terms of processing it, which would allow you to read it and prepare for any um, discussion or conversation in terms of next steps. Um, we probably at some point, normally we would um, assign it to either the board chair or the vice chair. We probably have to look at whom we would like to basically on the board um, kind of monitor and govern the process, kind of be our oversight from the board's perspective. And um, often that is usually a board member that is not named in the complaint. Um, so, or you could receive it tonight. <laughs> Or you could receive it tonight and then make a decision as to what your next step is without having to wait until December 9th. In other words, you could make a decision to assign it to a board member, have them kind of um, you know, create a process. You could even talk about a process tonight if you wanted to. So you could go a whole gamut from um, deciding tonight what the process will be to reviewing the document and then coming back on the 9th and deciding what that process will look like. And that would <laughs> obviously include putting someone in terms of an oversight from the board um, in terms of the complaint process. Okay, does that make sense? Any questions? Any questions? No. Thank you, Lisa. So I think as far as I'm going to suggest we insert a brief discussion item here very quick. Um, it's my opinion that I would like to see us receive the document and have the opportunity. I've not even seen the complaints against me yet. So I think it's fair that I ought to be able to look at it and uh, be able to see what it is that's being expressed and that we review and bring it back, presumably on the ninth, possibly on the second, if we go ahead and have that. Still, we've got to work on whether we're going to be on the second. So, uh, anybody else have any different thoughts? Would you like to comment? <coughs> Hello. Um, I'll just go ahead and agree with your thought process. Yeah, I don't know. I just I'd like to do the the, the uh, minimum we have to do tonight. I'm still processing a lot. That was a lot coming our way. <coughs> I mean, receive the complaint and, and do whatever minimum we have to do. But um, there's seven of us, and five were named in the complaint. So it, you know, I'll put my name in the hat as someone to, to receive it, I guess, or oversee it. Is that is that, is that what you mean? Yeah. Unless unless Herb would like to do it. No, I'm the director. <laughs> I'm in a slow time of the year. Well, I'm slowing down very rapidly, so I can I can dedicate some time to it. Okay. So I think I think that's generally consensus, and uh, I don't believe we have a plan. And thanks everybody for your comments. Appreciate it. Okay. Uh, we do have one discussion item tonight. It's timely. We have a lot of folks in the audience wearing stickers. I can see. The uh, Long Range Facility Planning Committee is the topic. And really, the discussion is around some of the recent goings on. We had a survey that went out. We had some feedback that was 
sent uh, to the board meeting, feedback that we've heard, at least myself, sort of third hand, second hand, third hand. Uh, we also had the kickoff meeting for the planning committee itself, which was fairly well attended. Uh, this is just meant to be a discussion since there was that much going on and giving folks an opportunity to speak to it, uh, share their thoughts about the process, how it was handled, and how we're uh, positioned in the board. So if anybody would like to share your thoughts, just make sure you've got the mic on it. We'll make this dialogue a little more structured than perhaps we're accustomed to. Okay, um, yes, um, I attended the meeting along with several other board members, and it was exciting to see uh, the high attendance. And I think as far as the other details, and I know that there's a lot of concerns out there, I've had people greet me in the community about them. Um, the rural schools, uh, as far as concerns from the public, it's off the table. I believe Mr. Peterson has made that statement multiple times, but um, hold it a little bit closer. Okay. Um, but overall, I think it's a very positive process. We're getting lots of people involved in this um, committee, and it does look like it will be expanding. And so that's what I have to say, and that's what I experienced. Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and speak next. If, if, so, so I've given this some thought, right? I mean, I've seen feedback that ranging from, I can't believe we sent out the survey, to I can't believe you decided to take it off the table as far as closing schools, to I don't think the superintendent had the authority to take it off the table, why were you letting him do that? To, uh, you know, I can't believe uh, you're even considering closing rural schools, right? All across the board. I think, if that showed any one thing, it showed that asking the question was pretty important, right? There's a pretty wide array of viewpoints out there. And I think under the surface, certainly under the surface for any proposed bond measure is likely to be this question of the rural schools. Um, I could talk about this for probably an hour. I've actually been up front petitioning this, the board specifically on this topic. In the past, I spoke out against closing Bethany before it closed, and I spoke out against closing Monitor before it closed. Uh, it won't be any surprise to you that I'm not in favor of closing rural schools. I attended one, my kids attend one, one still does, and I have absolutely zero intention of being part of any process that would be looking to shut down schools. I hope that alleviates some concerns. Yeah, Jonathan, Jonathan spoke to it very well. Um, um, as far as the survey and all the people that are you know, now paying attention, I think, I think it's great. I think the survey was a bold move, and I'm, I'm very glad it was sent out. It got people stirred up, so to speak, but now people are talking, and they're talking honestly, and they're involved, and I, th I think that's great. Um, this is a very important process, um, how we balance our long-term facility needs with the town schools, well, all the schools, the town rural. I mean, there, there seems to be that divide. Let's, let's you know, let's just, it, it's there. And um, and it's important that we balance those needs. And I'm glad that everyone's now paying attention and we're starting this process. And uh, I think it'll be a successful one. Um, I think it's sometimes hard to follow the discussion because everybody's busy, but I do want to, um, bring up the idea that um, the board, actually the facilities, uh, or excuse me, the, um, the budget committee uh, recommended and the board approved a budget that actually increased our facilities um, manpower, person power, uh, by a lot this last year. And it was a hard financial pill to swallow, uh, but one of the I don't know, ingredients in the secret sauce of this district is the, is the small K-8 schools, and, and that was, um, <coughs> those ideas were expressed when that decision was made, uh, and I think that, um, as far as I'm concerned, that's, that's where I stand, um, and I think the, the person who came up and asked 
and if we would all express um, how we felt, there was like not a timeline. I mean, obviously, our, our time on the board is limited, um, and I can't say 50 years in the future <laughs> what that's going to bring. But um, as far as, as short term, as far as I can see, um, that's an important part of our equation. The K-8 schools are a, a huge part of the success of our school district. So I just wanted to uh, put those points of view in, in the mix. Yeah, I, I'm going to agree with with Jennifer and, and uh, the other things that have been said. And I also want to call out, um, I think, Paul's process that was granted a little bit like ripping off the Band-Aid in terms of sending out that survey and then um, and even the architectural report, which was, um, you know, there was some tough news in there. That was that was a, a lot of data, but it really got the, the group uh, sort of hitting the ground running. And the fact that so many people showed up and Paul was so inclusive of whoever was there to say, hey, here are the different sort of sub-working groups and this is how we're going to move forward. I just feel very confident this is going to be a community-driven process, and, but a well-organized one. And so um, I, I think we're on the right track. I think we've got some, some difficult uh, facility issues that we have to deal with, but I don't think anyone's suggesting that the answer to those issues is to close schools. Um, we just have to put all of our best brains on it, and including a lot of participation from you all and other members in the community, um, to make some, you know, hard decisions when, when we, the things we want to do are more than the resources that we have. So I'm just really pleased to see how many people were willing to put in the time. And Paul warned them this is going to be a long haul and a lot of work, and people said, sign me up. So I'm very pleased to see them. Um, I just wanted to say that, um, yeah, Paul did mention the sausage making of this that's going to be happening. It's going to be positive. It's going to be difficult at times. We're going to have conversations that we're not going to enjoy. But the one thing that got me very excited as the board member that, is, that was appointed to this committee or I volunteered was the longevity of the committee and the commitment of the people that came from every single school. And when he went around the room and said, I'm from Evergreen, I'm from Victor Point, I'm from the middle school, I'm from here, it was, it was a meeting that I had never been to before where every school was represented. And everybody was cordial, and they wanted to get to work. And I'm all about the work. I'm all about the research, I'm all about digging deep, and getting to work. So, that's why I, was very excited about the meeting on Monday because we have to have these discussions and we have to make a plan for our community and our district in the long term. This could be a two-year commitment for, for, for this committee. That's how dedicated everybody is to making sure that there are plans for our community in the future. So I just wanted to reassure you that um, when I was there, I enjoyed myself, I liked the, the communication, I liked the discussion, and it excited me. It, it was very exciting. So, if you have any questions, please let us know. Let us know if you have questions, if you have concerns. We are here for the long haul. So again, normally we'd kind of be having a dialogue. Again, it's a little bit harder with the, the mics. The, there was one thing that um, I wanted to make sure that I made a point of, which is that as to the 
timeliness of the survey, which, as Tom, I think, rightly said, got a lot of discussion occurring, which was really good. The, you know, this was actually part of the strategic plan was to look at the long-range facilities. And we specifically asked our superintendent, his name's right next to the line, to spearhead this. And he got the conversation going right off the bat. And I'm really, really pleased to see so many people here in support of the case. I got, um, I, I have, excuse me, Senator. One more comment, you know, um, I'm from Scotts Mills, my kids went there, went to Monarch, all the rural schools and all that. And a lot of the discussion right now is about the rural schools, but I, let's not forget that the, the building, the educational building with most needs in this district is the middle school in town. So let's, let's not forget that. And to be clear, that was, you know, it's, one of the things that I witnessed, I'm going to soap out just for a minute, since I joined the board just over here ago, is a lot of underlying us versus them going on in this town and community. And it's really saddening me. I've seen it come out in a lot of different ways. And I think, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to find comfort in a group that you're comfortable with. The, uh, the rural schools, everybody bands together. I'm, I'm one of them, like I said, I petition this year. But I do agree, we need to all talk together about how we can solve these problems. It's not gonna happen by pitting one group against the other. It's not gonna solve it. And anything else on the current agenda? Suggestion was if we wanted to take a five minute break before starting into the administrative and staff reports. Uh, anybody else? You like five? Okay, we're going to take five minutes. Okay, we're going to. Uh, you, you just sit there. We'll go ahead and get started. Thanks, Paul. So we're doing an uh, update on the strategic plan. So I'm just going to start with a little apology. Uh, my name is Paul Peterson, the interim superintendent. So for this next piece, uh, if I turn my back to the audience, uh, although I really want to talk with y'all, they're my bosses. Uh, so I need to communicate to them how we're doing the strategic plan. So uh, I'll try to talk to everybody. So uh, we're about uh, 11 weeks into uh, the implementation of our strategic plan. Uh, I'm really pleased that we're providing our first update to the board. Uh, we are going to share with, you, with the board uh, and public where we are in the work. Um, and just as a reminder, this is year one of a five-year strategic plan. Uh, so we're just getting started. And as I'm about to share with you, I believe we're off to a really good start. Uh, we'll be bringing attention to many data points that reflect where the district is on our indicators that are listed in the strategic plan. By the way, the strategic plan is on the web, uh, website and is, and is available for everybody. Um, and uh, we are, we're also pleased to be revealing a, a visibly upgraded and more dynamic view into our work and our outcomes. Uh, we'll be doing two more major updates like this during the year, but I'll remind us uh, that our principles uh, also include relevant data on our indicators uh, in the strategic plan each time they present at board meetings. Uh, one last thing, this is a new dashboard, um, really just created in, in, within the last uh, 10 days or so, and it's a way of publicly sharing our work. Uh, our team has worked hard on it. We're trying something new here, and so we really appreciate constructive feedback. So on our main home page, uh, if you pull down the district menu to strategic visioning plan, continuous approval plan, loads a page, and on this one, you can see, get a copy of our strategic, uh, strategic plan and vision document, and then there's a link to the strategic plan indicator dashboard. So this is the big reveal for tonight. This is new. 
So, we are going to uh, walk you briefly through uh, these, each of these indicators. Uh, this first page, where you see the green and yellow, this is just sort of a summary, kind of a table of contents, if you will. And this captures uh, where we think we are. We use a rubric to score uh, and to rate ourselves whether we're on track, something is needing attention, or something is uh, uh, really at risk. Uh, things, things that are, we've identified uh, in the plan that we haven't even started working on, we'll call those at risk just because we haven't started working on them. Uh, doesn't mean we're destined to fail, it just means we haven't started working on those yet. So that's where we are. So as you pull up this dashboard, uh, these, these are each uh, hyperlinks to a little bit more information on this. So indicator 1A is on track, we feel really good about this, and we have some data here to share. So this is uh, indicator 1A, is all freshmen will pass 100% of the courses. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over now to Jennifer Hannon who's gonna share with us um, the, the, the details. Not all of them. I will encourage you to just click through it at, on your own as you have time. But as Paul mentioned, this is year one of a five-year plan. So our big goal for this first round is to identify exactly what we're measuring and, and where we are now. So some of it is baseline data. Some of it is baseline data yet to be determined. So we'll take a look just about more how it works so that you can go through it in detail on your own. Um, so the ninth grade, we as Silver Falls said we want zero Fs for our ninth graders. The state measure of that is they need to pass six or more classes by the end of their freshman year. So to the right here, we have what the state average is. So this is looking at the class of, of 2022, our sophomores, as our sophomores, correct? Um, so our state average is we have 85% of those kiddos have passed six or more each year and for Silver Falls we're at 97.9% by the state average. One of the things that we um, have found in Silver Falls though because we're very high performing so our margin for growth is pretty narrow, we've upped our, our measures by quite a bit. So we're not looking at kids who get six credits, we're looking at kids who have zero Fs. We want to look at all of their credits. So swinging to the left, our students, ninth graders currently, um, we have 85% of them who have zero Fs. Most of these kids, we didn't even put here what our current freshmen would be compared to the state average. I think we're 100%, 97%. I just singled out Johnny in the crowd. Never mind. Don't look at her. Okay. Um, more than one F, two percent of our kids currently, and then um, with one F, thirteen percent. So again, the state average would be only this little blue sliver here. That would be the state comparison. So we've got Silver Falls and the state. So that's how that one works. I would personally, I mean, you can scroll down if you'd like and look at each one this way. But personally, just so you can keep track of what you're looking for, I'd go back up to the table of contents and use the hyperlinks. So um, one I'll talk a little bit about because it's another one of those measures that we got a little bit of pushback when we worded it this way, that each student would achieve their appropriate academic growth each year. That could be a difficult one to measure. Um, so let's take a look at how we're measuring that. So um, K-8 students for last year, we did this for both reading and math, 67.22% um, of our kids K-8 met their growth targets in math, but come all the way over here, there's, well, the didn't meet is 32.78%. Those are the kids who didn't meet. So this entire chart on your right are the kids who did not meet. Now here's the odd thing about Silver Falls or maybe unique is group A, almost half of these kids are kids who are at or above grade level that did not make their appropriate academic growth. So in, I know, right? So in a typical district, they wouldn't even look at those kids. But we have said, like, our standard is that every kid, if they're at grade level or above grade level, we want them to get at least a year's worth of growth. Every kid deserves to grow at least one year. So half of our kids who did not make their academic growth actually are already at or above grade level. And then um, these groups, this kid, these kids, about 30% of the kids are um, 
did make at least a year's worth of growth, but if they are already behind, a year's worth of growth does not ever get them to catch up. So we need those kids to make accelerated growth, and they did not make accelerated growth. They made one year's worth of growth. That's not good enough if they're behind, right? And then these are the kids that we're very concerned about. This is 18.3%, not of our total kids, but of the kids who didn't meet who are both below level and not making at least a year's worth of growth. So that's how that one works, okay? So that, and then we have the same, the same graphs we're reading. We do this for attendance, and again there we flipped it. Traditionally in our previous strategic plan, we were measuring attendance rates, so our numbers were really high, 90s and above, right? Um, but on this one, we're just measuring our kids who are not chronically absent. So our attendance rates are very high for most kids. We've let fewer than nine absences, but we want to shrink our percentage of kids who are chronically absent. So our focus now is on the chronically absent group. So um, you're going to see, we, we have needs attention all the way through on this one. 1B, the students will have, you, oops, sorry about that. It clicks right to it for you. But um, we have needs attention all the way across for a couple of reasons because we're flipping our measure. Also, the state of Oregon has changed how they measure. So you'll notice our seniors, our high school students, like the older they get, the more their attendance drops. And most people think, oh, senioritis. It's actually not that. If you're not in the chair in front of the teacher, you're counted as absent, even if it's a school-related absent. So if you're on a college visit or on a golf or tennis or basketball game, you're still, that counts as an absence. So kind of the high school crowd would be deemed for doing exactly the things that we want them to do, be involved in extracurricular activities. That changes this year. So this one is going to take some, some reworking for us. That changes this year at the state average. Another thing is with our 13 buildings, not everyone is coding things exactly the same. So for state purposes, it's easy to pull data in very general um, areas. But for us, we like to be able to internally say, like, what's a religious holiday? What's a, when were kids sick? When were parents excusing? When were they gone for sports? When were they gone for extracurricular activities? So that essentially is how it works. Paula, did you want to talk? Oh, let me mention quickly, indicator two is all around um, social emotional learning and school culture. So what we've done for that, each school has addressed that individually in previous years. So every school is monitoring their school culture with a variety of tools, but we don't have an apples to apples comparison on that. So we have, for the first time this year, um, engaged a company called Youth Truth to run a standardized survey for us across the district, grades 3 12. There will be a teacher, kid, and parent survey. Um, and that will allow us not only to compare school to school, apples to apples, but nationwide and within the state of Oregon. So we think that will be a great tool, but we run that in February. So we'll be able to pull our baseline data in February following that. Um, and then, so that's why you'll see planning is on track, but there's, no, there's nothing to work with yet except at an individual school level. And then Paul, did you want to speak to uh, goal three at all? So as you can see, we're, we're definitely building this. Uh, I'm really happy with how the charts and graphs and the, the ability to hover over and see additional data. Uh, not everything sort of lends itself to a nice charts and graphs, but we're, we're uh, going to keep uh, building uh, towards that direction so it's really accessible and easy to read and provides uh, really good information. So uh, yeah, goal three, uh, each school reflects the, uh, each school facility reflects the excellence of education in our district. Um, so what I have on here um, is that uh, indicator 3A was a, the Long Range Facilities Committee will develop a facility management plan for board consideration. Uh, we have kicked that off, so I'd say we're definitely on track because we started, uh, but of course it needs a lot of attention and we will be giving it that attention uh, over the course of the year. Uh, indicator 3B is community members are engaged and aware of facility issues. Um, I think we've got a turnout here indicating that People are engaged um, and uh, uh, can, communicating with us, so uh, that's helpful. And, uh, and uh, indicator three C is school facilities are healthy, safe, and accessible. And this is a this is a, a great one uh, because it really lends itself to sharing uh, our reports that we get. So we've got things like water testing results, radon testing results, 
healthy and safe schools plan. Um, so those are hyperlinks um, on this area to other information. Um, and integrated pest management plan is up for actually uh, uh, supposed to be presented tonight. Lauren can't be here tonight because he's uh, home uh, quite sick. Uh, so we're going to leave it on the agenda, uh, notifying the public that we're uh, considering this plan. Let's come back next month for approval. Uh, so there, those are just elements of uh, having uh, safe, healthy, safe, and accessible schools. So there's uh, kind of a high-level overview of our strategic plan dashboard um, and how we're doing all those indicators. Um, I'm going to invite everybody to uh, take a look at this, bookmark this page, because we will be continuing to develop and update this uh, throughout the year with more information. Questions? I had a question about the growth, um, the graphs that Jennifer went over. Is it the um, state test that those are based on? Is there just the one indicator on that, or are, are there multiple data points that we're pulling from? Those are based on the Renaissance STAR assessment program. So last school year, our K-8 students took that assessment six times. This year, they'll do it five times. Thank you. And kudos um, with the youth crews. I've heard good things about that. Thank you very much. Yeah, we're excited about it. I'm going to ask everybody to uh, join me in giving a, a round of applause for uh, Director Hannon and the, and the principals who all put a lot of work into this in the last week. Paul. Okay, next up is the goal, uh, yeah, the goals update for our superintendent, and Paul, you're going to present the first one. Okay, I'll report from here. Uh, I proposed some goals for my work back in September, and the uh, school board then approved those goals in, uh, in October, October 14th. And so I'm just going to provide a quick update. I'm just going to read. Uh, this, this document should be publicly available. But I'm just going to give a quick rundown on each of them. So uh, uh, goal area one, which is communications and engagement. Uh, the, the first one is 100 school board site visits by June 15th. I said that uh, I marked that one in the yellow, which is at risk, uh, because I have 32 of 100 completed. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to be asking school board members to uh, sign up to go do more school visits with me. We're in this one together. Uh, next item was 20 board updates by June 15th. I marked myself uh, as definitely on track on that one. I've completed 13 of those 20 uh, updates so far. A little ahead of schedule. I even said I'm going to uh, do 100 tweets. I've done 27 tweets so far. If you're on Twitter, follow me at, at AwesomeSFSD. I only have like 26 followers. I can use some retweets. Uh, let's see, the next one is to do three newsletters distributed by June 15th. I mark myself as being, as that one uh, in the red as highly problematic just because I haven't started that work. Uh, I'm considering though whether to actually, now, now I'm considering whether to actually do that. I have, since, uh, since I wrote this, I found out that the, uh, the Our Town uh, publication does reach all postal patrons. Does that sound right? Uh, so, for example, I, I'll put uh, articles into that, and that's a great way to reach everybody. So I'm just I'm reconsidering that one. Um, it's not everybody. Okay. Well, I'm 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 interested in reaching all postal patrons within the school district. So I'll keep, I'll keep working on that one. Uh, number number uh, two goal area is implementation of strategic plan. But the first one is establishment of baseline data and measurable outcomes by November 12th. Well, here we are on November 25th, and I marked that as being on track. Uh, really pleased with uh, the, the progress we've made and the work that's been done so far to, to get that dashboard up to date uh, and publicly available. Uh, item B is a publicly accessible dashboard. Um, I'll mark that as on track. Uh, I want to thank to Derek uh, McElfresh for helping put that together along with uh, Director Hannon and all the principals. And the next one is board updates in November, February, and May. Um, so we're on track because we just did that. Uh, strategic plan uh, report to the budget committee in March. Uh, I marked that as, as yellow and at risk. Uh, just we're, we're not there yet. But I'll say that uh, the work that we're doing right now with the strategic plan uh, monitoring and uh, 
uh, that prepares as well for the first budget committee meetings of March. Uh, if not, having a budget committee meeting sooner to do some additional orientation and, and uh, training. Goal number three uh, of the strategic plan is my third goal area, which is uh, uh, each school facility reflects the excellence of education in our district. Uh, the first item is community survey to find out what people already know to be completed by October 1st, or excuse me, October 31st. Uh, I marked that as green on track because uh, that survey is completed. I didn't make it by October 31st because the survey went out on November 1st and was done by the 4th. So. Let's see, the next one is to continue to do homework uh, on that of demographics report, facilities report, debt payoff and capacity, uh, and information provided to the Long Range Facilities uh, Planning Committee at, at the November kickoff meeting. We did that, and that's another area that is now updated on the website. If you go to uh, pull on the district menu to school board, school board committees, you'll see one in there called uh, Long Range Facilities Planning. And all of the documents that were provided at Long Ridge facilities are all right there. All the survey results, all the data, the raw data, uh, the demographics report, and we'll just keep populating that area with more and more information. Let's see, where was I? Uh, oh, define the scope of work uh, for a consultant slash facilitator by mid-October. I'm behind on that one, uh, but I did identify some steering committee people to help me uh, get that process going so that we have a facilitator to help uh, facilitate Long Ridge planning meetings. Uh, the next one is the expansion of the Long Ridge Facilities Planning Committee to include more people. I've been October. Yet, yes, we have expanded that. Um, I think we will be uh, continuing to add more people to that process until uh, we're sure that we have all of our stakeholder groups represented. Uh, we'll have each uh, school, we'll have a subcommittee, we'll have uh, Every, every segment of our school district community is represented on that. Uh, kickoff meeting in November with parameters established. Uh, we did that one uh, here just the other day. And item F was meetings held throughout the year as determined in the scope of work. Uh, and I marked that as in, in the yellow uh, at risk just because we're started, but we have a lot more work to go. And the last one I wrote was uh, strengthening the licensed evaluation system and practices. I marked that as yellow uh, at risk because we're, although we started on that, uh, have a lot more work to do um, and uh, I would say that the principals and all the supervisors have, have been reporting to me that they are on track with all their observations so that's good and the last one is improved quality of feedback on licensed evaluations as demonstrated on a pre and post staff survey plus administrative review at close of the year to assess the quality of feedback given to our instructional staff uh, and I'll report uh, to the principals by midsummer and I just marked that as uh, red uh, just because we're, we're still so far away from that point, but we're uh, starting to have those conversations. So that's where I am with my goals. <coughs> Any questions? Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, I appreciate your detail as well. Anybody have any specific questions? <coughs> okay. Herb, any questions? Thank you. Uh, next up, we have our financial report. Steve, you're up. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, on pages eight and nine of your packet, uh, you have the two-page financial report, and this is also available online on the board book uh, packet online uh, for tonight's board meeting, if anyone wants to see it. Uh, general fund financials through October 31st. Uh, for the first four months of the year, we received uh, 33, almost 33% 33 of our budgeted revenues, which is right on track with projections. Uh, we are moving into, uh, as we moved into November, uh, November's our highest uh, revenue month of the year. Uh, we receive uh, at least 70% of our property tax revenue and 20% of our total general fund revenue in the month of November. Uh, and that's, that's been happening through the first three weeks. We've already received 73% of our current year tax turnover. Uh, on the expenditure side, uh, 
we are pretty much right right on target with you see the dials there with our expenditure but you can see the uh, the total salaries and benefits are slightly below projection the reason for that is because we, we haven't applied COLA yet we budgeted we budgeted COLA obviously but we haven't applied that to uh, on the license side we're still in negotiations as you know uh, so that'll be something that'll uh, catch up once uh, the settlement is reached uh, other than that uh, uh, expenses are, are on target there, so um, again, that's right where we expect to be, except for the, the one unknown at this point, so, yeah. Sure. Okay. I was wondering if you could answer a question for me. So I've had multiple community members approach me about um, the uh, state and timber money that recently uh, that happened on Friday. <laughs> um, they're asking if that could be, it, it, how that money works with the school system and if that does, or could you help educate us on what that means for our community or not? I think it was Friday. Somebody mentioned, several people mentioned Friday or Thursday. I don't know. <laughs> That's why I need you to clear to clarify. <laughs> yeah. well, well, state timber money is, is the one revenue item in the general fund budget that is uh, impossible for us to project, even when we talk to the counties. It, uh, they can't tell us uh, because there's open contracts out there and they don't know when they're going to close. Uh, however, uh, state timber revenue is uh, considered a local revenue source, just like current year property taxes, prior year property taxes, common school fund, county school fund, federal timber receipts. Those are all local revenue items. Uh, school districts get paid based on our total uh, membership weighted, average daily membership weighted, so our enrollment plus additional weights. Uh, times a funding factor, which is on that state school fund sheet that I, I show you about once every three months, or when an update comes out, and uh, that's called total formula revenue. Now, the state will then take the total formula revenue and take out what our projected local revenue is, which includes state timber, uh, and then that difference they'll divide into 12, and they pay us twice, double payment in July, and then one 12th payment August through May. So. Uh, once, uh, once everything's reconciled, once they get audit reports uh, from all the districts, uh, they'll do a, an adjustment the following May. One single state school fund year or budget year lasts 27 months. It opens up in March and goes all the way until uh, May of the following year until it's closed. So if we get more local revenue than we projected, uh, then they would do a negative adjustment in that following May, or if we get less than expected, or enrollment's higher, they, they do a positive. So all districts are getting some sort of adjustment every, every May. So, so while we received more timber revenue in 1819, quite a bit more than we, uh, you know, projected, that all gets reconciled out on the other on the other end. Thank you for that. Yeah. You bet. Any other discussion for Steve? Everybody good? Okay, we had actually several more items on the agenda tonight. However, uh, we're gonna have to postpone item D, Healthy and Safe Schools Plan, and item E, Integrated Pest Management, as Lauren is unfortunately ill. So we won't be getting those reports tonight. Actually, we have copies of some of them, but we won't get the presentation. Um, and we had also had on the agenda to have the superintendent search calendar discussion and uh, report from Sarah Herb. She could not make it tonight either, so we are looking to move that to December as well. And that concludes the administrative and staff reports for tonight. Next step is board reports. Does anybody have anything they would like to share?
Hi, I just wanted to share some things that I've been doing in the past few weeks. Um, I had the privilege to attend the OSBA November School Boards Conference up in Portland, November 14th through the 17th. Um, it's a four-day conference, Thursday through Sunday. Um, and I attended the afternoon session for the learning from Alaska's framework and a whole school, whole community approach to trauma-engaged practice. Specifically, I was able to engage in the portion that covered social and emotional learning. What is the board's role? Intentional trauma-engaged policies can help school systems and community integrate trauma-engaged practices and build social and emotional support. I was also able to visit many vendors at the OSBA convention. Some of the vendors I visited were Applied Window Solutions. Um, this is a company that provides um, windows for uh, buildings um, in your district that are, um, that if you try to shoot a weapon or a gun at the, at the glass or anything, it won't go through. And they have to try to penetrate to get into the glass multiple times, and it's a, it's a really amazing safety factor. So I talked with the representative there, and he was, really informative um, about um, his product, and I um, will have more on that on my Facebook page if you want to read about it. Um, I also talked to Tayer Incorporated, a privately owned company who has been providing schools with local and sustainable food service. Wanted to get another um, opinion about um, food service and other companies and what they do and how much it costs. Um, Recreation Today was um, all about playground equipment. It just felt like, felt good to go into the playground vendor. <laughs> um, and on Friday, I attended a general session. The topic was the hidden biases of good people, implica implications for educators and the populations they serve. Uh, this is a general session where everybody at the, um, at the uh, convention attends. Um, all the district board members and superintendents were there, they usually attend them. Uh, the, presenter brought his, the presenter was Brian Marks, a National Training Institute on Race and Equality Executive Director and Principal Trainer at Moore, and he's also a Morehouse College Associate Professor. It was a really good um, presentation, um, and I'll have his um, presentation up on my Facebook page as well, on my board page if anybody's interested in listening. My next session I went to was building a communication strategy and community engagement around the Student Success Act. There were a lot of sessions um, geared towards um, what the criteria is for the money that could potentially come to districts for the Student Success Act. Um, and I was really happy that they had so many uh, sessions to go to, so we as board members um, can you know uh, make sure that that money is used the correct way in our schools, um, and our financial guy Steve can <laughs> say this is how much we have and this is what we can do. So that was it was really good. Um, I attended the OSBA regional roundtable. Um, that means that we all, uh, and all of us in Marion County, um, we get together. Um, to talk about what's happening in our regional area, which is Marion County. What's happening in our own districts, we learn from each other and um, what you know other uh, board members are doing, what superintendents are doing. It's really informative and it's a great way to get to know other people in our region. Um, on Saturday, um, the breakfast session was critical issues. Um, again, the role of the school board in the School Success Act, uh, attending that. Um, the next session I attended was the Title IX compliance. Um, it refreshed my memory on the requirements of Title IX in regards to class offerings, processes for sexual harassment complaints, and investigations and athletic programs. Um, the attorneys from OSBA gave really excellent information, and again, I'll have a lot of that information up on my Facebook page if anybody's interested in the specific details of that. Um, I also um, went to another session called Best Practices for Trauma-Informed, Culturally Proficient, Comprehensive Sex Education. Let me get it back. Um, it was very informative. The, the whole OSBA experience up there was very informative. I was happy to attend and meet new people 
from other districts and to continue to learn more and more about how we all are working towards the same goal. And that's to give our students the best learning experience possible and come back with supporting information for um, our superintendent and our uh, and so he can do his job in implementing that at the at the school level. Um, after the comments, after the conference was quite a week. Um, Monday we had our work session here in the choir. Oh, we were in the choir room. Sorry. Um, it was a good meeting, and I look forward to our next work session. After the work session, I worked. I walked over to the auditorium to join. So I to join the town hall meeting. The city of Silverton planned to have for our community members. Mayor Kyle Palmer invited the school board members to join in the important topic of equity and inclusion in our community. It was an honor to be asked, and I enjoyed the joint effort with the city council members and the mayor. On Wednesday, there was a bargaining session between our district bargaining team and the te our teachers union, Silver Falls Education Association. I believe it is important to demonstrate support to our district administration bargaining team, as well as our teachers and staff. We are all in this together. After that, I walked over to the library to attend the uh, Long Range Facilities Committee uh, meeting. I volunteered to be one of two board members to be on this committee. My role in this committee is to basically sit on the sidelines, listen and report back to my board members on the progress of the committee. Board members on these committees don't get into the weeds of the information. That's the job of the committee. That's what their work is. On Thursday, I attended the first of two community input meetings for the permanent superintendent search process. It was a productive and well thought out meeting that was in the choir room. There were only two community members there and three board members. So I'm really hoping and crossing my fingers that a lot of our community members are taking the survey online on the district website and it's on, also on social media. So if, you have, if you're not able to make it to the input meeting of the superintendent of the permit superintendent search, please take that survey online. We are going to use that information and use that data and speak about it and, and implement it into our just long process decision making. I also have been with Paul several to, on several uh, school uh, field trips. Um, we, I went with Tom Buchholz, myself and Paul. We went to um, Bethany and Silverton Middle School and Silverton High School. And it was a pleasure to go to those schools and have some really good conversations with the principals. Um, and we got to see some, got to see some teachers and talk to them. Um, and so it, it was really nice. And then the next one I went on was with Paul. And we went just a couple of weeks ago. We went out to Scotts Mills. Um, and I missed Kirsten. She wasn't working that day, so I was kind of bummed about that. But um, we did get to talk to a first grade teacher, Megan. She, was, she gave up her coveted planning time to talk to us. Those of us that are educators know how important our planning time is when <laughs> we have it. Um, so it was very nice. Um, it was a great tour. Um, stopped at Butte Creek, talked with Kevin Palmer, had great conversations about what they're doing out there and what their community is doing in their school. Um, he was very informative about what they're doing with their grounds. He was informative about um, the um, seismic upgrade in their gym. Um, we got to sit in and observe um, a class, which was wonderful. And this teacher wanted us in there, so I was very um, privileged. I, I felt so proud to go in there and watch her teach the kids. Um, and we went to Mark Twain. And um, Greg Kotz gave a great tour. Um, he showed us so many things about that school and what they're doing there um, for their kids and teachers. And he had a brand new um, document that he has been keeping track basically in real time about kids' grades and the test scores and such. It was impressive. And I, I asked him if I could have a copy of it. <laughs> um, but, but he um, is really digging deep in there at, that, at Mark Twain and, and doing work um, 
really well. So I just want to thank all of those principals and teachers and students and staff at those uh, schools for allowing me to tour and taking a break to talk to me. So that's my important report. My week looked pretty identical to Shelley's. <laughs> the OSPA conference, and then I think we had a total of four different meetings over the course of the week. Um, so I won't repeat. She summarized it really nicely. Um, the one thing I do want to say is one thing that I um, really uh, understood very clearly when I was at the OSPA conference and, and hearing more about the uh, Student Success Act dollars was that not only are they designated for um, certain priorities, certain programs, but they really require you to, when you put in your applications and you present your proposals, to do all of that through an equity lens. And so we're learning what that means as we go through this process with the state and with the Department of Education, who's got some great tools to help school districts make sure they, they are able to get the money that has been designated for them. And it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, a significant amount of money. We want to make sure that we are uh, proposing things through an equity lens. So when we talk about equity in the district, it's not just because it's important to us and we want to move that forward um, on its own right, but because it, it, me it means that we don't leave money on the table, that we get everything that the state believes it's important for our district to receive. So that was really, really helpful. There, as Shelley said, there was a lot of information about the Student Success Act because it is a, as, as Paul can attest, it's a process between now um, and next year in, this, in the uh, uh, 2020 school years when those funds will be able to be used. It's going to be a process that we have to go through in order to qualify for those funds. Um, so that was very, very helpful. And yeah, I would just second everything else that you said about fantastic speakers and, and just we feel like we've come, come back with so much information and some really good tools to put to use. Or anything that you'd like to share? Yeah, I would, John. Uh, last month, I had the privilege to take the day off of work and uh, go visit four rural schools. Well, one of them wasn't rural, it was somewhere in middle school. But uh, with Paul, uh, short notice, and he was more than willing to go with me, and uh, all the principals were excited to do their job and they're enthusiastic. Um, I was sad I was not able to participate in the um, convention this year. I think I've missed three out of the 10 years, so it's something I always look forward to doing. Um, but even though I'm working out of town, I'm still involved in schools. I was, uh, I was able to go to a rural school the only rural school I've ever gone to that had two cattle drops crossing at the entrance and the egress. And uh, I was able to go to uh, support their FFA fundraiser dinner. So that was interesting. So. Thanks, sir. And I'll, I'll briefly mention that I was participating in the collective bargaining session last week. I, I'm feeling really hopeful, actually, you know, it's a, it's a group of teachers and administrators that are working hard uh, nailing down these last details. And, uh, you know, I want to I specifically, you know, call out the work that Dan has been doing, Kevin Palmer, Steve Nielsen, Drew. I, I mean, this has been a group of folks that have been really thoughtfully looking into this and trying to move us all forward. So, kudos to you guys, thank you, appreciate it. Okay, uh, if that is it for board reports, then we are going to move into our second public comment. This one is limited to discussion and action items, and the only action item we have yet tonight is the budget committee appointment. So, there are two vacancies. Anybody who would like to address the board? Hi. 
Wow, this is impressive. Um, I'm Sarah Wexman, and I've been attending school board meetings regularly since about 2014, and when um, teaching field was a big issue at that time. And I continue to come almost regularly to almost all school board meetings for a while as a coach and friends of music rep. But I'm speaking tonight not for friends of music, just myself. Um, I wanted to thank you for the thoughtful discussion regarding the Long Range Facilities Committee. Um, Tom might well remember I made comments a while ago that I was disappointed that it didn't get started earlier, um, that the committee was put off for a little while, and so I'm really pleased to see that there was such a robust um, energy, and I wish I could have been at the meeting on Wednesday night. Um, but what I wanted to say was that I really noticed that um, the discussion is thoughtful, your discussion is thoughtful, and that during this time that might be a little bit rocky in our district, that you've all had really good discourse. And it's clear to me that the seven of you um, want what I hope everyone in this room wants, which is the best for our kids. Um, the best well-rounded education, the best kid-centered decisions, the best staff, the best equitable curriculum, the best facilities, and the best use of our funds. So I just want to thank you for your time and your care, and I really appreciate all your hard work and your extra volunteer hours, and um, I appreciate the service that you do to our community. Thanks for your service. Um, during discussion on the K-8, I didn't clearly catch a clear answer um, regarding on-site budgeting. So my question for each of you is, will you continue to support on-site budgeting, or will you push to move to district-enforced budgeting? Um, so please, just so it's super clear, I was just hoping you could each answer on-site or district-enforced because there's a big difference between the two. Thank you. Yeah, I, well, I think that's fair. So the, the one thing I'll mention right off the bat is that, it's, that there's a little bit of a, of a hybrid anyway, right? So you know, we, we can talk about site-based budgeting, central budgeting, and I think there's right now what I would label as a, as a hybrid approach. And there are some things somewhat mandated at the district level and sort of rolled out uh, uniformly, if you will. Uh, and then I think there are a lot of discretionary decisions made at the schools. Um, you know, I think there's going to be some discussion about that. I certainly support allowing for local control. I think I support, generally speaking, having control over those dollars as close to the students as we can support it, right? Anytime you, you centralize things, you get further removed from the people making day-to-day -day decisions. And I don't think that's the right decision, personally. So while I I'm going to call it a hybrid. I, I do support uh, site-based decision making. Anybody else wants to speak? Yeah, me too. Um, as, a, as a very new board member, I wish I could answer that question, um, but I don't feel I can. We've not discussed it. Uh, I don't have an agenda either way. I, I don't know enough to know um, the pros and cons, um, and so, I mean, I could just say sure, but I feel that that would be dishonest, because I, I don't know, I have enough information. I, you know, we're, we haven't started our budget process for me to sort of get deep into how we do that. Um, so, I don't mean to dodge it, I just don't feel like I have enough information, but I have no desire one way or the other at this point. I, actually, I'm with Janet on this. Um, I was speaking to Steve Nielsen, I uh, believe, last week. And my understanding is, is that I need to know more. Um, I, I'm new at this, and I want to hear both sides, and I want to understand it fully, and for me to make a decision at this point, without all the information, and for me to review it, um, I, I can't make a decision at this time. So. I'm waiting to be educated and have that clarified for me. Um, so what I'd like to say to that is um, I think that um, um, is as a, as a board member and part of a larger committee, 
what I'd like to hear is from other people on the committee and how they feel about that and what the numbers are. We've never really discussed that at a budget committee meeting. It's never really been a, a topic. And so I want to get more information. I don't like to solely say something that I'm going to say, nope, that's it, we're not going to do that. I, I'm not a, I don't like to do that. I'm a I like to have a team. I like to get different perspectives. I like to get different information. And from that large budget committee, I want to be able to have discussions with all of those people to say, okay, this is what works here, this is what works here, this doesn't work, this works. So um, I'm not going to say one way or another because at this point, um, I, don't I, I honestly don't have a lot of information about it. But I do want to hear from the, from the committee. And that's 14 people, um, seven board members, seven community members that have volunteered their time to be on the committee. And so that's my response to you on that. Um, maybe we can bring that up in the budget committee this year and explore that and dig deep into all the numbers and make sure that that's the direction that, you know, the budget committee wants to go. Okay. I would say that um, I have questions about budgeting, probably always will, um, but I trust principals to make the best decisions for their buildings um, and also, keeping an eye on the strategic plan. So I, I think that that is, um, I think that's what happens. And I think that, yeah, I personally have a level of trust in, in principles to make those decisions. Her, I think you want Well, I, I think that was a question posed by the public, correct? Yes. We gotta be careful that we're not answering those questions like we said we would. Okay, fair, fair enough. And, and just for clarity, I mean, we do have the option. I mean, it's, it's not necessarily common, but I think in this case, it was an interesting question with very specific ramifications for a lot of people. Here, so. Anybody else that would like to address the board tonight? Okay. With that, we are going to move straight into our action item. We do have one for tonight. We are going to vote on budget committee members. There are two vacancies. This is a three-year term. And we will be uh, proceeding under a process where we are, going to all, to, we are going to all fill out ballots. And as soon as we have two individuals with at least four votes, we will complete this process. And uh, Debbie and I, Covering that correctly? Do I do I have that correct? Was I missing anything in the process? No. So, uh, with that said, everybody should have some ballots in front of you. I believe that we do. We certainly can. There it is. <coughs> so, if anybody would like to have an opportunity to share something ahead of time, that'd be fine. Uh, when we discussed it last time, the, the, the decision, or at least my recommendation, was that when we discussed the votes, we described why we did how we did. Okay. Any other questions before we go through the first one? Or does anybody have anything they'd like to share? I guess I'd like to hear from everybody about... Um the candidates and, and what you find to be important, because I have some idea of who I am gonna vote for tonight, but I am open to um, other perspectives. So I guess I'm, I'm looking to hear from other people. Anybody who wants to share right away? I'm not able to see you. I would like to see Nicole Olivier Levis and Scott Walker appointed to our district's budget committee. 
Both Ms. Levas and Mr. Walker exceed the expectations for our district's need of two budget committee members. Ms. Levas' bachelor's degree from Western Oregon University focusing specifically in business management that includes accounting and finance, her service to the City of Silverton Budget Committee, and her review of nonprofit organization budgets as part of a policy council for the Oregon Child Development Coalition solidifies the exact qualifications to be appointed to the committee. She is a brand new applicant. She is a registered voter. She is not an agent, employee, or officer, and her occupation is spot on. She fulfills our budget committee policy criteria. Mr. Scott Walker has a wide variety of expertise and satisfies a very specific need as well for our budget committee members. He is a program evaluator in budget analysis for 25 years. He has a master's in biostatistics. Served on the City of Silverton Budget Committee. Served on the Marion Soil and Water Conservation Budget Committee. He is knowledgeable with Oregon local, Oregon local budget laws. He lives in Silverton and has been a longtime volunteer in our district, which indicates to me that his direct contact with teachers, administrators, facilities, curriculum, and a host of other important topics is a big bonus to appointing him. One other unique and important fact that jumped out to me is his vision and philosophy to improve the trust and support of the whole community in our public schools. He also fulfills our budget committee policy criteria. Anybody else have anything they'd like to share with other board members before we proceed? Okay, thank you. All right, well, nobody else is going to try to convince me. Um, I will um, say that, that I intend at this point to vote for um, Dr. Creighton Holmes and Nicole Olivas-Leva. Um, I am interpreting the policy um, to say that uh, the board may appoint budget committee members as to as many consecutive terms as deemed appropriate. However, it would be the usual practice to limit services to two consecutive three-year terms. Um, I'm going to stick to the idea of limiting to two consecutive three-year terms. Although I really appreciated the service, or appreciate the service, she may continue, um, for, of, of Robin Welch. I think that um, her expertise in, in wealth preservation um, is useful in this uh, endeavor. But uh, also, Nicole olivas Leva also has similar background. Um, and. Dr. Creighton Holmes um, offered an, a very impressive uh, application, and I feel like he really understands um, what the issues are in education. So those are the two people that um, I'm leaning towards at this point, but again, um, if somebody can make a great case, I could be persuaded. I'm going to have a hard time persuading you. I was leaning towards the same two candidates for largely, almost identically the same reasons. So, uh, yeah, I mean, if, if we're interested in sharing, that's where I was thinking. I, I didn't, I wasn't able to attend. I was out of town for the work session where uh, they were able to introduce themselves. However, I did watch the video, and uh, I felt that Dr. Holmes would make a, an excellent candidate, as would Nicole, based on her uh, application. Yeah, um, I intend to vote for Nicole, and and I guess the main reason I'm going to speak out is I'm going to break our little, um, our little, but our but our policies suggestion, and I'm also going to vote, um, vote for Robin. Um, she's a rural voice, and it seems like we're getting out of balance on the on the um, on the budget committee with rural. Just kind of that you want folks from folks from various regions just to kind of spread the news and stay connected. And I think I think that's very important. Um, I was going to make, but so yeah, that's um, that's my intentions for, for breaking that guideline, I suppose. I guess I'll say that that 
was something that I considered as well, and will continue to consider as we um, consider tonight. Okay, with that, we are gonna do our first round. Please mark two individuals and sign and pass it down. Jennifer Trager voting for Nicole and Robin. We have got Janet voting for Nicole and Scott Walker. Shelly voting for Nicole and Scott. Herb voting for Nicole and Robin Welch. Tom voting for Nicole and Robin. Lori voting for Nicole and Scott. And myself voting for Dr. Holmes and Nicole. Nicole. Yes, Dr. Creighton Holmes and Nicole. So after the first round, Nicole is a uh, unanimous selection, and nobody else received four votes. So at this point, we are going to proceed to another round, and uh, if anybody would like to speak prior to it, feel free, otherwise we're going to proceed right to it. Oh, we are, in fact, just voting for one. Thank you. That's a good point. Actually, you know what? I'm going to change what I just said. We, I think we all need to still vote for Nicole. I, I want to make sure the final signed ones indicate the final tally. So if you go ahead and vote, we all voted for Nicole. Go ahead and fill that out and when you sign it and then vote for another candidate, please. I'm sorry, thank you. Tom voted for Robin. Herb voted for Robin. Jennifer voted for Robin. Lori voted for Scott. Uh, Shelley voted for Scott. Janet voted for Scott. And I voted for Robin. So I think that We have two members, Robin was reappointed and Nicole was appointed. Thank you everyone, I appreciate that. Okay, Jeannie. 
Thanks, Mr. Chair. I, uh, when I was doing my report, I forgot to uh, provide another uh, aspect of my report that I didn't want to miss this opportunity to, to do here. Um, and it's just a message about thanks and Thanksgiving. Uh, so in honor of Thanksgiving this week, um, I just took some time to pause from the work of strategic planning and implementation and negotiations and all of the emails to do something that's even more important in life. And that's to stop and express a heartfelt thank you to the people around me. I will, I'd like to express a big thank you to the school board for participating in the town hall event last week with the city council. I thought the event was a success and I applaud Mayor Palmer, the city council, and the city staff for facilitating such a well-run community conversation. Uh, and especially big thanks to the student athletes, coaches, fans, and supporters of all of our fall co-curricular programs. I have really enjoyed watching our student athletes, musicians, and performers reflect on the best parts of each of us and the best parts of our community. This is a special place. And in this moment, I invite you to pause and reflect on how lucky we are to witness students achieving, growing, and performing at their best. Thank you to our teachers. Do we have teachers in the house tonight? <coughs> teachers, stand up and let's give them a round. Thank you to our teachers for making learning so powerful and meaningful for going above and beyond for our kids. I want, to, uh, I want to say thank you to our support staff. Do we have any support staff in the house? I saw Vance. Let's have them stand up. Let's give them a round. <laughs> We're not standing, but I think it's you. Um, thank you also to our principals and leaders who stepped into the leadership arena every single day. I just want to take a moment to give a shout out to all of our principals who all got a new boss this year and as, they've, and as they have accepted the new challenges that often come with the new boss, they have stood firmly for what's best for kids and supporting the traditions of excellence that they, our teachers, and our support staff have created over the years. Uh, any principals and other leaders in the district, please stand up. Be recognized. I'm likewise grateful for the people that surround me every day, including the district office staff, with whom I am honored to work alongside every day, and for whom taking care of the rest of our district family is just what they do. I see you all back, back there. Let's stand up and be recognized. Our district office staff. And thank you to the Greater Silver Falls School District community. Your support for students and our schools is inspiring and appreciated. Uh, I'm also going to say thanks to my family, uh, Tracy, Evan, and Kate, for all they mean to me. Uh, to them, I say you make life, uh, you make life and living beautiful. Uh, I wish everyone here, all of our students, and all of our staff, and everyone who is part of the Silver Falls School District Extended Family a wonderful Thanksgiving with family and friends. Thank you. Okay, with that, we are going to uh, take a brief recess and then readjourn into executive session under ORS 192660B to conduct deliberations with persons designated by the governing body to carry on labor negotiations and ORS 192660I to evaluate the superintendent or top executive. Thanks. Wait, we're going to go back into regular session. There's one brief topic we need to discuss, which is the December meetings. We have one on the 2nd and one on the 9th schedule. Those we are sticking with, unless I hear any objection from the audience or the board. Yeah. <laughs> You're my audience. Right? <laughs> are we still with the agenda for the 2nd? Or is uh, the agenda is still going to have to get hammered out, okay. but uh, I'm specifically trying to make sure that those dates are the ones that they are officially what's listed. But, uh, is the December 2nd a regular board meeting? Or it's going to be a work session and the session. night would be and the then, Oh, I'm sorry. The work session will be the 2nd and the night would be the regular board meeting. And the 16th is canceled. 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 It was a canceled. Canceled. Yeah. The month or so is close to break. I know. <laughs> okay. Without any objection, work for me. there you go. Yeah. Meeting adjourned. Oh, my right. God.